Hi, this is your Sapin Bharti and welcome to another episode of TFR Insights. As we all know that broadband and connectivity is uh, the backbone of modern society. It's even more critical to the economic development, health and education for uh, Native Americans. However, the tribal communities don't have uh, the kind of internet access that we would desire. Uh, but MiddleNet is uh, an organization, a nonprofit organization, which is leading an in initiative to leverage open source technologies and bring connectivity to these uh, communities. And today we have with us Mariel Trix, CEO of MiralNet and Boris Rensky, founder of Freedom5. Mariel, Boris, first of all, welcome to the show. Tell us a bit about MiralNet. What, uh, when it was founded, what was the problem that you're trying to solve? There's about two thirds of uh, people living on tribal lands don't have sufficient connectivity, if having any connectivity at all, to the internet. MiralNet was founded in 2017 by a bunch of volunteers, and uh, what we were tackling was the tribal digital divide. Uh, connectivity on tribal lands is much worse than anywhere else in the country, and what we felt is, in order to make the world more equitable. And in order to bridge the homework gap, we can find a way to get connectivity to the homes. Unlike other countries, though, the issues when it comes to getting connectivity on tribal lands isn't necessarily one of infrastructure uh, in the sense of uh, there's usually fiber to almost every school. So there is some sort of high speed connection to almost every village. And, and also electricity, for the most part, is also present. What it often is, is what we call the first mile, otherwise known as the last mile. So getting it from that centralized place and distributing it to homes, that seems to be one of the biggest issues. If you look at the U.S. in general, you know, we all see that, you know, sometimes rural areas, they don't have connectivity. But is it something unique with tribal land? Is it the, 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 lo the location, the geography uh, that, you know, these services uh, do not make into those communities? Partly for sure, that's the geographies. When, when uh, indigenous peoples had their lands taken, they were pushed into the corners of the United States that, were more difficult, were harder to live, were um, more challenging. Uh, but then, even then, if we look at connectivity rates for tribal people living on lands versus non-tribal people living on lands, it seems like the gap is always, uh, tribal folks seem to have about half the connectivity no matter what metric we're looking at compared to their rural counterparts. Let's talk about the initiative that you have started to bring to leverage open source technologies and, of course, technology like Freedom Fi that they are developing to to uh, to kind of uh, make these technology more accessible to these communities. What we did back in 2017 is we put together a tech stack, off-the-shelf carrier-grade LTE equipment, and these new open source uh, softwares, the cores that would run the networks. And uh, our goal was to be able to lower the floor, if you will, make it so that anyone can start their own network. Costs, we're looking at about $15,000 to connect your first 30 people. Um, deployments, uh, we were able to put stuff up in half a day. Uh, so really removing those barriers so people can run their own networks. Now, once we accomplished that, we realized there were other problems and sustainability was one of them. So what's great about these open source cores that we're using is once uh, some of our partners will decide to stick with Magma, stick with an open core, we wanted to find them a partner that they can count on that can host that core and provide the technical support um, and support the tribe's autonomy. And now, Boris, I would like quickly jump to you as, uh, as she mentioned that uh, because the Spectrum released last year and a lot of these technologies are becoming more affordable. And I also remember <laughs> a nice uh, video that you created where <laughs> anybody can now go and you don't have to spend millions of dollars to get access to these technologies. So talk about how not only these open source technologies, technology like Magma and also Freedom5, you are making things more affordable, accessible. I see that you are kind of democratizing these technologies as well. So talk about the technology part, how you, this, this lowering the cost access is enabling uh, organization like MiralNet to bring those technologies to these communities. At Freedom5, we have a um, kind of a, you know, an interesting belief in uh, what the true value behind the next generation um, cellular technologies that, you know, people commonly refer to as 5G is all about. So most people uh, in the space are generally excited about it because, you know, all the new capabilities related to low latency and millimeter wave spectrum, et cetera. But um, at Freedom5, we personally believe that really the biggest disruptive change 
in this new generation of wireless technologies is the true disaggregation between the hardware and software and the ability to deliver a lot of the uh, kind of cellular network logic in software and specifically in our case, open source software, which consequently results in dramatic order of magnitude kind of cost savings for rolling out these networks, which is exactly um, what is required for actually, you know, connecting that last mile and connecting the unconnected. So unlike, um, you know, much of the ecosystem that is, you know, kind of going after the millimeter wave and, you know, the shiny latest greatest, we primarily focus on making it super affordable to actually deploy small, medium scale private cellular networks and kind of, you know, connecting that last mile. How did you come across Freedom Fi? Why did you choose their technologies and how it's enabling you to, to help with this initiative? So as a nonprofit, what we do is when we partner with our um, tribal partners, we leverage donations, we leverage volunteers, we leverage ag- testing um, in Silicon Valley. So we did a lot of testing in order to improve upon Magma. However, that's not a sustainable model. So I came across FreedomFly because they were developing the, the business case, if you will, that was appealing to our partners. Uh, where they have these small or medium-sized networks, most of them are under 100 homes. And the Freedom Fly platform to give them the confidence that they would continue to get the technical support that they were getting from our Silicon Valley volunteers, um, that was huge. That was absolutely huge. To have a company that they can count on, to have a number that they can call, to feel like there was someone who had their back as they ran their networks. What does it mean for Freedom Fire to work with a nonprofit like Murunet? Because you also get a very good a case study, you also get a very good use case uh, to, to validate the technology that you're working. And at the same time, you are also doing something for greater good than just uh, <laughs> monetizing from open source technology. So can you talk about that aspect? First of all, it's fun um, and it feels good to be doing that. Uh, but more importantly, um, as Mariel alluded to it, you know, all this kind of next generation cellular open source software is, you know, somewhat new. And we are, you know, while dramatically bringing down the cost of the network rollouts, are traversing an uncharted territory. And with uncharted territory, always comes a lot of kind of, you know, corner issues and problems that you can't really know about until, you know, like the rubber hits the road and then you're actually, you know, providing the service to the customers. And we have, you know, um, like sizable portfolio um, with like a diverse mix of customers. Um, some of them are larger enterprises and telecom operators, and some of them are, you know, smaller organizations that are trying to, you know, roll out last mile connectivity. And um, it's the latter category that we actually tend to learn from the most and improve on our software the most because they move much faster. The need is much more acute. Um, and they really kind of, you know, push the boundaries of what we can do as a company, which is a huge, valuable learning experience for us. And we take all of his learnings, we put them back into the open source community as code contributions. And then ultimately everybody, including the larger customers that we work with are able to, uh, benefit from. So, you know, while it's cool to have, you know, large, fancy fortune 500 brand names as your customers, just getting, you know, a telco or a large enterprise to deploy the first site can take, you know, like months, if not in some instances, years of compliance and security and all of the stuff before you actually, you know, send the first packet across the wire. With partners like Mural, you know, we just started working together and we started like kicking off the sites and just bringing up sites and getting people connected right away. And it's very rewarding, and it's also an enormously valuable learning experience for us. How do you see this as a use case? Because this is a very good use case, um, but uh, if you look at the rest of the world, there are a lot of countries, there are lots of locations, they still lack um, you know, connectivity. So do you think this will be a very good use case to, to, to kind of replicate this model elsewhere as well? Yeah, I think that, uh, and this goes to the point that I've made before, um, you know, 
It is in places where the need for connectivity is most acute, which is the, you know, rural areas, tribal lands, you know, countries where, you know, connectivity penetration is not as high, um, where people, you know, go from zero connectivity or very little connectivity to some meaningful amount of broadband, where this need is very acute and this need kind of a creates the sense of urgency and propels the adoption. And with adoption, you actually get to, you know, basically mature the software and then replicate the success. So I think that um, it's absolutely applicable to, you know, not just the, you know, tribal lands and the work we're doing in Mural, but, you know, any rural use case, be it in the U.S. or even outside of the U.S., Mariel, I'll come back to you uh, as initially you're talking about first mile versus last mile. And there are a lot of initiatives that were going on. Facebook had their own, you know, uh, companies are coming with a balloon. Elon Musk is sending a lot of rockets with Spacelink. Uh, so can you talk about with all these technologies and now Freedom Fire and all the uh, democratization of uh, uh, LTE and 5G, how is this all working together to enable uh, organizations like MurilNet to bring connectivity to uh, to these communities? Well, it's definitely empowering communities to bring connectivity to themselves. And it's interesting because we talk about use case. I would actually posit it's use cases. There's 574 sovereign nations within the United States. That means 574 different value systems, different rules, different terrains, all of it. So it's really a, I see it as um, a lot of innovation that's going to happen. Some people will do SpaceX. Some people will do um, the micro geos that are out there. Some people will do open source, uh, open 5GS versus Magma versus all sorts of different things. The Combinatic Torx problem actually has all the use sites it needs in the United States in order to test out these technologies. And like Boris alluded to, these are sovereign nations. They can roll it out fast. They don't have to worry about a lot of stuff and they just move so agilely and will find Freedom buys so many interesting problems as they already have. Um, it's pretty amazing. I mean, just this weekend alone, we're going to be helping launch three new networks. Uh, where do you get to do that in a weekend? <laughs> If you do look at uh, these uh, sovereign nations or uh, tribal communities, um, when we look at these technologies, are they just consumers of these technologies? Or are there also a lot of innovation coming from within those communities where they are also trying to uh, come up with solutions as well? I would say that it's um, both. Uh, some of our partners, Navajo Technical University, for example, uh, Diné College, a lot of the tribal universities um, and a lot of the tribes, they are putting together their own ISPs. Um, they're the ones who are making completely new business cases uh, for sustainability that's not necessarily based on a capitalistic system. It just doesn't work with a lot of the communal cultures. And yeah, they're putting together tech stacks. I mean, what, I, what I'm seeing happening in Alaska, if you want to know communities that can make things happen by their, on their own, some of these villages, they're going to figure out how to make it work. Uh, and sometimes you think it's just going to be... Uh, uh, how should we say duct tape and uh, WD-40? But uh, no, I was just talking to um, Alaska Group this morning and they're taking existing infrastructure, DSL modems, and they're re, uh, redoing the architecture of their network. So that port one is your typical connection to the internet. Port three connects you to the clinic and port four connects you to the school. Where are you going to see that? I mean, tons of innovation happening within these communities. Mariel, Boris, thank you so much for talking about this initiative. It's, it's as Boris, you were saying, you know, it's also about, it's fun. It's also makes you feel good as well uh, to, it's not just, and Mariel was saying, not just about the capitalist society, but also to work for the community. So once again, not only thanks for uh, joining me today, but also for this initiative. I look forward to talk to you guys again. Thank you. Thanks, Appreciate welcome. Y'all take care.